What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another special, well, not special, but fun edition of the Bombastic Podcast, presented by Natty State Sports and hosted by Andrew Ellis. Uh, guys, we got a lot to get into because the Hawks suck, or so or so I've been told. Uh, Arkansas, number one, or no, no, no longer number one, they finally dropped a series on the road at Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Uh, the title of last week's episode before we went out of here was does Gorilla Ball travel well? Can confirm it does not. Uh, it does not travel well, or at least it didn't this weekend. Um, so we will be reacting to Arkansas's first series loss, what it means, how will the program respond from here, all that fun stuff. We're here to answer your questions to answer, does this team have it? You know, Are we panicking yet? How are we feeling about that? We're going to get into all of it. Um, but I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, I want to, again, just got to get a few housekeeping notes off at the beginning. Uh, need you guys to continue subscribing to YouTube. We've been crushing there. Um, our, our, our separate channel, I should clarify, The Bombastic on YouTube, separate from the Natty State Sports YouTube channel. But some of you may have joined me, or a lot of you did, on Friday. We did a nice little live show, series preview of the Alabama series. Picked a great weekend to do it, the series they decided to lose. Uh, so maybe it's a bad omen. We'll see. We'll confirm this weekend when they go to South Carolina. Uh, but I had a lot of fun doing that. Curtis, big baseball guy, even he said it was decent. So I know that I know it was, you know, at least not horrible. So if you missed that, you can go check that out. It's on the main Natty State YouTube channel under the live section. Um, and be on the lookout because we're going to be keep do we're going to continue doing stuff like that. Uh, if nothing else, just to preview some of these series. But we might do be doing some like post series live sessions. I might just go live on a random Wednesday afternoon because I'm bored. Uh, but I like talking to you guys, like hearing your questions, like you know. I just like talking Arkansas baseball. I could talk Arkansas baseball all day long, and uh, that's what I do on this program. And so I enjoyed getting to do it with some of you guys on Friday. So be on the lookout for that, and make sure you're subscribed to the main Natty State Sports YouTube channel. And, of course, be subscribed for all the other good stuff, not just me. Curtis and Scotty have been crushing it with Pot at the Palace. Just, uh, they just posted an episode, so you can check out their Monday morning edition of the PATP, um, which now has a new logo because there's a new head coach and all that. Um, so I know that things have died down a little bit with the coach Calipari stuff, but recruiting is about to heat up here on that front. So be sure you're tapped in with all that they're doing. Of course, the John neighbor show is live every day. We've had a couple nice episodes of the boss hogs podcast. We also went live Saturday to recap the spring game. So if you missed that, go check that out. Um, we actually went live twice. When I say we John and we had this <laughs> just peek behind the curtain here. We had this nice little plan where, we were at Razorback Stadium. We watched the spring game, and I was like, all right, me and Scotty are going to go to the press conference, listen to Sam Pittman, see what he has to say, while Curtis and John go live on in the stadium and start the whole process. And then while I was in the press conference, I was checking it, and John and Curtis, it looked all grainy and weird, and apparently the audio was weird, and it was windy, and just wasn't great. So we ended up just doing it at the office. But uh, if you're curious about the Arkansas football team and just the spring game reactions and just kind of our – I guess our final thoughts wrapping up spring practice, go check out that live stream, which also happened on the Natty State Sports YouTube channel. My boy Scotty wrote a really nice story of his four takeaways from the spring game. Our written content has really been cranked up here lately, uh, especially on the basketball front because Curtis and Scotty are demons uh, in the basketball writing game. They dominate the coverage completely. Um, so go check all that out. we got a lot of fun stuff going on and more fun stuff to come here at Natty State HQ. Um, so now let's uh, let's turn our attention to the thing that everyone wants to talk about the 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 bad stuff that happened this weekend. I feel like when Arkansas plays poorly or they lose a game or lose a series or whatever, I feel like people are always looking for this to be like a they suck podcast or a everything is fine podcast. And I feel like you probably whoever's listening to this right now, I'm speaking to you. You probably fall in one of those categories. You're either coming away from that series being like, man, I I hate this team. They don't have it. They can't win the title. I just I don't I don't see it. This team does they played poorly against Alabama, so how are they going to win a national title? I don't see it. You probably are either in that category or you're in the category where you're like, everything's fine. Why is everybody freaking out? It's just a series loss. Like everything's perfect. Like this team is still great. They're 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 still going to win the national title. Like nothing's wrong. Like the offense is fine. Uh, Nate Thompson is cool. Like you're probably saying stuff like that. I think I'm in the middle there where yes, they sucked this past weekend. They definitely did. They dropped a series loss for the, uh, a series for the first time. Offense just went completely stagnant. Uh, I mean, they scored five in five runs in the first like five innings of that first game. 
and then just didn't do anything the rest of the weekend. I believe they finished the weekend with eight runs, which is tough, especially against a pitching staff that's not great. Um, but here's here's kind of the way I view it here is there are three things that I believe in my heart of hearts and my brain, which is very large, to be true. Number one, Arkansas played very poorly this weekend against Alabama. It was not a good performance by any means. Uh, I really, I mean, I'm, there's, there's, it wasn't all bad. There are some positive things here, but if you're looking for like a big picture takeaway that's really good from the weekend, I don't know where it's coming from other than maybe just the pitching staff or Gabe Gackle or Hagen Smith. I don't know. Um, but it was a very rough weekend at the office for the Arkansas Razorbacks. Second thing that is true in my heart of hearts and in my brain of brains, it makes me a little bit more concerned when I think about this team big picture and kind of the direction things are going and whether you know what this team is going to look like on the biggest stages, which we all expect them to be. Because uh, last year, last week, I was coming to you telling you, you know, kind of saying, hey, optimistic about this offense, saying, hey, I think they're turning the corner. The stats are starting to, to trend in the right direction. You know, we'll see if they keep it rolling this weekend, but they're one weekend away from being like in really good shape offensively. Um, so the fact that I was doing all that last week and then they followed it up with such a stinker, I mean, their worst, arguably their worst weekend of the year other than the Arlington trip, which also sucked. If y'all remember the podcast I recorded right after they went to Arlington, go back and listen to it. I was hating, hating on those boys. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, so this this weekend, it definitely makes me a little bit more concerned than I was going into the weekend. That may be 1%, maybe 2%, maybe 5 10 I don't know. I'm not with some of you guys where it's completely changed my viewpoint of the team. But it definitely is, uh, you know, definitely didn't ease any of my concerns about whether or not this offense could kind of go toe-to-toe with some of the best in the country. Um, now, three, the third thing that I truly believe in my heart of hearts to be true Arkansas is still a bona fide national title contender, a the team that is good enough to win the national title and arguably the favorite to do so. Even with all those things I just said about how poorly they played and how the offense has disappointed me and all that, uh, I think all three of those things are unequivocally without a doubt true. I mean, you can argue with me if you want, like sure, you know, you can say actually they're not good enough to win the national title or actually they didn't play well this weekend or actually I'm not that concerned like whatever. You can you can pick which one of those three you dislike the most, uh, but just that's just kind of the way I view it. You're not entitled to view it. The, you, you don't have to view it the same way that I do. But that's the kind of where I'm at. Is this team offensively is leaving a lot to be desired. There is a lot of meat left on that bone offensively. They have not eased up anyone's concerns in terms of you know people always say like oh I hate their I hate our approach. I don't think people know what they mean when they say stuff like that. Like, I don't think they really do. Uh, I think they just see a guy get out and they're like, oh, bad approach. Uh, like, I, I saw someone say bad approach uh, after like a nine pitch at bat that ended in a ground out. They're like, oh, rough approach. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know. Or it was Ben, actually, I lied. It was Ben McLaughlin's double play ball where Jared Sprague leads off the inning with a an opposite field single to right field, and Ben McLaughlin works like a seven or eight pitch at bat, ends up rolling over and getting a double play ball, and they're like, oh, I hate our approach. I don't think you know what approach means. I think you just say words. Um, but anyways, talking about this offense, I'm not saying you can't be critical of this offense. I just think that people, when they are, they say things that I don't think they know what they mean. Uh, but I think if you're just looking at you know the facts and the actual numbers behind this, there is no argument to the contrary regarding this offense being extremely, excruciatingly, painfully average. I mean, they just are. I mean, I, I I don't dislike this offense. I don't dislike this team. And, like, there's plenty of pieces that I really, really like. I mean, I've talked about some of them. Peyton Stovall, Vahiva, Loy, the main ones. Uh, but this offense, big picture, I mean, if you just compare it to other lineups in the SEC, statistically, whether you're using runs, batting average, which I've told you is kind of a stupid stat, uh, on base percentage, slugging, whatever. Arkansas is like about middle of the pack, a little bit lower, a little bit higher, like just right around that average range in the SEC, in the context of SEC baseball. When I say average, I don't mean like, st- you know, around the country, like UC Davis is better than them, but I'm just talking about the standard, which is very high because Arkansas plays in the SEC. They're competing for a freaking national title. Arkansas's offense is pretty average, I would say. Um, now, again, like I said, that doesn't disqualify them from being a national title contender because this pitching staff is not average. In fact, they're very elite. In fact, they're the best in the country. Uh, again, for using the facts and the statistics and the trends and metrics and all that 
whatever you want to use, ERA, strikeouts, strikeouts to walk ratio, uh, opponent's batting average, whatever, whip, as they say. Uh, Arkansas is elite. They are arguably the best in the country at all of those things. I think statistically at one point last week and probably still this week, they were literally the best in the country at all of those things. Uh, and even this weekend where they where Arkansas didn't even play that well, like I said, they give up three runs on Friday night. They give up four runs on Saturday, and they give up five runs on Sunday. That's an ERA of four for those. Actually, a couple of those weren't on, uh, weren't earned, or at least one of them weren't. Uh, but yeah, like that that is a pitching performance that is good enough to get you a goddamn sweep if you have a good offense. A sweep if you have a good offense. And Arkansas, honestly, could have swept Alabama, probably should have swept Alabama. I mean, <laughs> they give up four runs in ten innings on Saturday, like – you know, I think and I'm, it kind of leads me to a great point. And I, I didn't plan on this being the case. Sunday they lose five to nothing. I didn't plan on this being the case, but kind of the way, at least I view it now with this offense, and you probably should too, is are they going to score five in this particular game? Like whether it's a Friday night, whether it's Tuesday, Saturday, whatever, can Arkansas score five runs today? If they score five runs, they are probably going to win or at least have a really strong chance to. Uh, and if they don't, they can still win, but it's like, I think that should just be <laughs> the barometer that we view this offense through. And I, and look, I would love to sit here and tell you like, yeah, this offense is going to get it going. They're going to start mashing. You know, they, they have the potential to be as good as anyone in the country. I can say all these fake things, but based, there's nothing that <laughs> we have seen this year. Big picture. I mean, the sample size is pretty big. We're talking about five weeks into SEC play. And there were four weeks of play in before that. That's nine weeks of baseball. Which, you know, if you're in the context of MLB, isn't like a massive thing. But in a 60, 65 game season, we're halfway over the halfway point now. You kind of just know what you are. And Arkansas is not a bad team. I mean, they're definitely not a bad team. They're, de- they're not a bad offense at all. Um, there's plenty of productive things they do, plenty of productive pieces in the lineup. But I just think if you go piece by piece to it uh, and you just say, hey, are we, what's this guy's potential? Are we getting that? it's really hard to say you're getting full potential out of a lot of guys. I mean, let's just go on down the list here of the stats page. So Peyton Holt leads this team with a 349 batting average, which is pretty, pretty hilarious. By the way, you see my missing persons list here. Peyton Holt is not on that list because he got two, two starts in the field at left field uh, this weekend. Uh, I liked it. I like to see it. I thought he played really well defensively out there in left field. I thought the lineup, he brought a little bit of a spark. I don't think he had a hit in Sunday's game. I don't want Nobody had a hit in Sunday's game. Uh, but he had a humongous, humongous game tying home run in the ninth inning. Uh, I think he had at least one or two, one other hit. I'm gonna fact check myself. He actually had a lot. He had three hits in Saturday's game. He had two two out singles and a huge two out home run, which kept Arkansas alive. That's the Peyton Holt experience right there. He he brings a little bit of that spark, a little bit of that grit, and that's what makes it honestly very disappointing for me and all the other Peyton Holt fanboys out here. Uh, because we thought, hey, this is a guy who could bring that type of spark to the lineup. And I feel like he did, and just nobody else, you know, brought it there. So it's a little bit tough, you know, in terms of just pure cause and effect and all that. I mean, baseball is an individualistic sport. So it's not like basketball where inserting Peyton Holt in the lineup took away from anyone else. Everyone else sucking had nothing to do with Peyton Holt. Uh, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent here. But, anyways, Peyton Holt leads this team with a 349 average. You could not argue that Peyton Holt is living up to his potential. Because he ain't playing. He hadn't been playing a ton. He's playing this weekend, which is cool. Would love to see some of that moving forward. But clearly, Arkansas has not gotten the most out of Peyton Holt because they haven't played him. Uh, Peyton Stovall's hitting 341 uh, in a small, you know, he hasn't played the entire season. Five home runs, 22 RBI. They are getting what they're getting full potential out of Peyton Stovall. Maybe he could have a little bit better, maybe a little whatever. I'm willing to concede that they are getting full potential out of Peyton Stovall. Uh, Jared Spraglot, 319, five home runs. I'm willing to concede they're getting what they, you know, their their full potential out of Jared Sprague. I'm sure, you know, he had really good numbers last year. It's not like he's overachieving. I would just say, like, I think they're getting what they should be getting out of Jared Sprague. Uh, Nolan Souza, who, if you look at his numbers for the year, you know, he's hitting 314, slugging 643. He's been awesome. I would say they're getting full potential out of him because he's a freshman and there's going to be some ups and downs. Did not have a great weekend at the office this weekend. I think that's going to continue. He's going to have his big flashes with a few you know, games here, especially against lefties that are a little bit tougher. 
Uh, but big picture, I think they're getting about what they can get out of him. Ben McLaughlin, his batting average has dipped down to 200. I believe he's, uh, I mean, he might have been, he might be over 200 in SEC play now because he had a couple hits on Sunday. Uh, but he's been like hovering around 200, getting walked a lot. We saw this dude hit like three, 350, 360 last year. Uh, and now he does have the six home runs, which is nice. He's starting to show some of that power, but I would say they are not quite getting full Ben McLaughlin potential. I think DVH would tell you that himself. I think Ben McLaughlin himself would tell you that. Uh, Vahivo Aloy hitting 279 with nine home runs. He's been a lot better lately, and I'd say like we're seeing kind of what he can be, but I don't think anybody believes that we're getting full potential out of Vahivo Aloy. Ross Lovich is hitting 276 with nothing. I mean, he hadn't played a ton. Uh, not getting a ton out of him. Kendall Diggs is hitting 264 now with six home runs. He's on pace for about 45 RBI, which would be about 20 less than he did before. You're clearly, obviously, not getting a ton out of, out of or at least full potential out of Kendall Diggs. Hudson White hit 300 with 11 home runs last year. He ain't doing that shit this year. Uh, clearly not getting full potential out of him. Ty Wilmsmeyer is having the worst year of his career, and he's been in the SEC for three or four years now. Clearly not getting full potential out of him. Jack Wagner, Jason Jones, Ryder Helfrick. Do I need to even talk about those guys? You're not getting full potential out of them. So overall, big picture, you add it all up, you get an offense that's underachieving. That's what Arkansas has done this season. Uh, in conference play, they were starting to turn the corner, but getting shut down by a pretty mediocre Alabama pitching staff is tough to justify, and it's tough to come to terms with. And frankly, my brain doesn't know what to do with that information. Because part of why I was starting to kind of push this little Arkansas's offense is good narrative last week, which I did with a story and came on this program and did it, is because they were starting to do what they should do, which is make you know make opponents pay for their mistakes. Against LSU, they were really good about that, kind of waiting, finding a time to strike, taking their walks, doing what they had to do, working pitchers, getting these guys out of the game early. Uh, against Ole Miss, same thing. I thought they did a really good job of – you know, capitalizing on every Ole Miss mistake. Uh, but we learned this weekend with Alabama, Arkansas is a little bit dependent on their opponents making mistakes, whether that be just like leaving pitches over the heart of the plate that they can drive or just simply walking them and having those guys on base all the time. Uh, Bama did not walk Arkansas much. Let's see for the weekend. Uh, I can pull this up real quick. So Arkansas worked five walks on Friday. They worked one walk on Saturday and two walks on Sunday. So in those last two games, I mean, that those two games that Arkansas lost, that's a three combined walks in about, I guess, 19 innings of work. You see what Arkansas can do when they're not getting that help from their opponent? Not a ton. When this offense is being asked to string together multiple hits or, you know, create the traffic on the base paths themselves, they really struggle to do it consistently. Uh, and I mean, a lot, of, a lot of folks do, but... You know, I just I just don't think there's really a case to be made that this offense is firing on all cylinders or like living up to their potential or like really a lineup to be worried about that other SEC teams should look at and be like, oh, we gotta we gotta tread lightly. Those backs they swing it. You know, again, Arkansas's not a bad offense, but they're uh, they're all right. And I think from a big picture standpoint, when you just look at this program in 2018 and 2019 which I think those two teams are kind of like two of the best teams Arkansas has ever had. I mean, 2018, how many times have I said on this program that's the best team Arkansas has ever had? There's been a noticeable, clear, identifiable drop-off from what Arkansas was doing in those two seasons as an offense to what they're doing you know, since 2021. 2021, they scored a ton of runs, but it was a lot of walks and home runs, which is fine. They hit over 100 home runs. That kind of philosophy works – when you hit a ton of home runs and you have a ton of power, uh, Arkansas is really not even doing that this year. They're, I believe they're like sixth or seventh in the SEC in slugging. So like, you know, about middle of the pack. I think they're sixth or seventh in SEC play for home runs. Uh, but big picture overall this year, they're like closer to ninth, tenth in a lot of those rankings. So it's like Arkansas is not an elite power hitting team. So if you're not getting on base a ton, you're not hitting for a ton of power, you're, you know, you're, you, drew, you were drawing a ton of walks coming into the weekend, but you're not drawing them now. It's like, are you really a good offense, or did you just face LSU and Ole Miss? It's starting to look like they may have just faced LSU and Ole Miss, which, as you can see here, are not doing very well. A lot of teams are doing well against those teams. Um, and so Arkansas has got a lot of big tests coming up. But again, going back to big picture for the program, I think it's fair for you guys to say, hey, why does Arkansas not mash anymore? You know, 
like obviously those 2018 and 2018 or 2019 teams set a very high standard, but that is the standard. Like this is an elite program competing for national titles that brings in elite talent year in and year out. They have top five recruiting classes. They have top five transfer classes. They have guys go, you know, go on to get drafted all the time. A ton of these pieces in this lineup are guys that are getting a ton of buzz as draft prospects. So why is Arkansas not among the top in the SEC and the nationally in hitting or even really close? They're really closer to like the 100 range the last four years. Uh, and that really wasn't the case in 2018 and 2019. And so it's like every, every, cause every reason you could give me in terms of like, Oh, well they're facing elite pitching or, Oh, well they're just kind of, you know, hit or miss sometimes. Or like sometimes they're better. All of those things applied in 2018 and 2019 Arkansas just had dudes who could go out there and get it done. Uh, Arkansas just doesn't have guys that are really week in and week out bringing that threat that Ar- that teams need to really circle and be cautious of. Uh, and it's very fair to wonder why. Big picture, like why is this offense just kind of settled into a stretch where they're not bad, but they're not necessarily good either. Um, the 2022 season is the one that really drew a lot of red flags for me because – you know, I mentioned that 2021 offense that hit a ton of home runs, drew a ton of walks, was number one in the country all year long. I mean, you know, they did what this current team has not accomplished in terms of winning every single series in SEC play. And then they kind of, you know, rolled over and let let NC State pet their belly in the Super Regional and just completely failed to show up in those last two games. Uh, you know, so it's like you came from that season, you return – a ton of pieces. You return Caden Wallace. You return Jalen Battles. You return Robert Moore. You bring in an elite transfer catcher and Michael Turner. You've got all these pieces. You would have expected that 2022 offense to take a noticeable step forward, and they really didn't. And in hindsight, the more I think about it, I'm like, that was that was a red flag. That was a little bit of a red flag. Part of why I ignored it and why a lot of you probably did too is because in the postseason, if you remember, That lineup raked. Uh, Arkansas almost won the national title that year. It probably should have, like I've talked about a couple times. Uh, Ran into Ole Miss in the semifinals and got shut down. But that team raked in the postseason. Uh, That Stillwater Regional that we all remember, that offense was crushing then. Uh, They didn't score a ton in that North Carolina series. But in Omaha, even, they had two elimination or one elimination game against Auburn where they scored like 10 runs. They scored 17 on Stanford in the opening game. Like That team had a lineup that really – teams had to worry about one through nine they were fighting you they were making you work up until that last game of the year uh and so part of it was just a little bit easier to look back look over the pat the fact that they really underachieved drastically in the regular season because they played so well in the postseason it was like okay i'm not gonna really nitpick too much a team that finished on the doorstep of the college world series finals you go to 2023 and honestly i feel like offensively in the regular season at least Arkansas was better in 2023 than they were in 2022 when they had all these pieces on paper and entered the year top three and were like this kind of clear talent driven team. Uh, 2022, they were better offensively, and that was despite over going, you know, over overcoming a ton of injuries to Josenberger and Wagner. Uh, I feel like uh, Parker Rowland missed some time a little bit. Uh, it was just a year where Arkansas had a bunch of issues, and they were they were you know. I was, for the most part, I was pleased with what Arkansas did. I didn't feel like they underachieved a ton. And so going into this year, I really kind of talked myself into it. I mean, you can go back and listen. Uh, I've referenced it a few times now, but one of the first episodes of the Bombastic Podcast I did was titled Setting Expectations for This Arkansas Lineup. And I went through and just went through piece by piece and was like, hey, this is probably what this guy should do. This is based on what he's done in his career, what Arkansas has done in years past. Like I kind of, I set the expectations based on all the information that was available to me of kind of what this team should be and what this offense would look like. And they've fallen very far short of that. (laughs) And they, I mean, you know, there's still plenty of time left. I'm not saying they're, you know, it's very possible that Arkansas rakes down the stretch. They turn that, they hit that switch like the 2022 team. Sure. That could totally happen. I just have no longer come to expect it to happen based on how the first nine weeks of the season have played out. Um, Arkansas is underachieving once again offensively. They underachieved in 2022. Uh, they underachieved when the moment came in 2021. 2023, they had some issues. Uh, but I think it's a real, like, there's a little bit of a pattern here. 
And I don't know, you know, everyone can have their reason. I know a lot of people like to just blame whatever coach they Google and find out is responsible. So everybody's going to respond to this and be like, see, Nate Thompson sucks, fire him. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to go that far, especially for a guy who, again, I talked about all the talent, is bringing in elite talent year in and year out. And Arkansas has been productive offensively. It's not like this is a bad offense that is not producing or they're like inept. They're like Virginia basketball offense. Uh, They still have plenty of moments here and there, but just for the most part, Guys, I mean, if you want me to go through the numbers, I can. Arkansas is average offensively. They just are. Like, we, the, the numbers are what they are. The results are there for you every single weekend. You can go look up the SEC overall stats and the SEC conference play stats. Uh, you're not going to be blown away by what you see where Arkansas ranks amongst all these other teams that they're competing with. You're just not. Um, but again, getting back to the full picture here, when you just look at what this pitching staff is and what they've been doing and what they're capable of doing, this offense doesn't have to be elite. They just don't. Uh, if the, if this offense were elite, this would be a lot less stressful of a season. The rest of the year, you wouldn't have to worry. You would be like, hey, this is the best pitching staff in the country. They've got this offense that is really impossible to deal with. Uh, you know, I just don't see any way. You know, you'd feel very confident going into every weekend. Um, I still think Arkansas, I would favor Arkansas to win – just about any series against anybody, including AM, who they're about to play and go to College Station, I will be favoring Arkansas to win that series. I just will because of how good this pitching staff is. Um, but I will have a little bit more hesitancy than I would have just because of how this offense has failed to materialize in the way that we all kind of hoped and thought they might. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I just think that we have to adjust the lens in which we view this team through. I think this team I, – I didn't go into the year thinking this was going to be a team that had to, like, count every run and really had to, like, make sure anytime there's a run, there's like, oh, we got to get them in because we might not have another chance and who knows. Uh, I think this team is just a little bit more dependent on their pitching staff than I thought they were, which is disappointing. As someone who covers the program and has been observing it and expected a little bit more, I thought this lineup would be a little bit closer to this pitching staff in terms of where they rank in terms of – the country and the nation, the SEC, they don't have to be first in everything like the pitching staff is. But I thought there would be, you know, games where this offense could bail the pitching staff out. That is clearly not the case. Uh, This this team is, they have to stay ahead of schedule. They have to have leads early. They're not able to really overcome deficits late. Like they kind of have to stay on schedule and get a formulaic thing going here, which they are still going to be able to do more often than not again, because of how damn good this pitching staff is. So I don't want people to hear this and be like, oh, Andrew's super down on the team. He doesn't think – I still think this team's going to win the freaking national title. (laughs) Like, I still think they're going to be very much in play to do so, Uh, and I think they're definitely getting to Omaha. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But, guys, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and act like I'm not a little bit concerned with what I'm seeing out of these bats. I think you should be a little bit too – by the way, before I before I take, you know, game by game and just kind of go through what I thought from each game, I do what I did. I have LSU baseball's schedule pulled up. Because I remember them being in a lot of low scoring games down the stretch last year and on their way to a national title, but I wanted to confirm and just make sure so I knew I wasn't going crazy. So LSU hit their way to Omaha, uh, for the most part. They scored seven runs in their first game of the regional, scored six runs after that, scored thirteen in the regional finale. You know, good work. They beat Kentucky fourteen to nothing in the super regional, then beat them eight to three the next game. Obviously, I mean, as you notice, these final scores, pitching staff doing a lot of work, but the lineup was raking. Uh, but then you get to Omaha. I think people obviously consistently overrate how much offense you need to win a national title. Because I see this all the time. I hear I see these comments where people will be like, "This isn't a national title offense." Which, like, if you're saying, is this team going to win a national title because of its offense? Yes. They, you know, if this team were dependent on hitting to win them a national title, it would be tough because they, they just don't have that high of a ceiling offensively. Uh, but I don't think this team needs to be lead offensively or anything really even that close to it. So I disagree with people who say they don't have a national title offense because they just have to be all right to, to win a national title with this pitching staff. But anyways, back to LSU, who, again, this is an LSU team that had Tommy White, Dylan Cruz, Hayden Dravinsky, all these guys, you know, who are going to be playing baseball forever on top of Paul Skeens and all that. But this is what they did in Omaha. They won a six to three game against Tennessee. Again, not like they, you know, they needed four to win that game. 
didn't get a ton of offense, but they got enough to win the job or to get the job done. They lose their next game three to two to Wake Forest, which again, not a ton of offense, not like they needed a ton. Uh, they then they have an elimination game against Tennessee, which they win five to nothing. Again, I hope you're paying attention. One run would have won that game. Uh, then they then they play game two against uh, Wake Forest. They win five to two. Again, not a ton of offense. They got the job done. Cool. Five runs, which I referenced earlier, is kind of like the barometer for what you need. Their final game against Wake Forest, elimination game, goes to eleven innings. And it ended via walk-off, via Tommy White. He hit this awesome home run that I'm sure you guys all saw. They won that game two to nothing. Again, I'm just putting it into perspective. Like, this is the team that won the freaking national title last year. Uh, and so it's like, you know, if you had told, if you if if I told you going into it, like, hey, LSU's only gonna score, I guess let me do this math here. Six plus two is eight plus five, that's thirteen, plus five, that's eighteen, plus two, that's twenty. 20 runs in their first five games in Omaha, you would have probably been like, oh, they're in trouble. They're only scoring four runs a game. Like, they're, they're going to be in trouble. They weren't in trouble. They went four and one in those five games. Then they go to the game game one of the championship series against Florida. They go to extra innings once again. They win four to three. Again, just how these games play out. Now, here's now here's where my narrative falls apart because they lose game two 24 to four. <laughs> it's a real thing that happened. I'd kind of forgotten that happened. They lose 24 to 4 in game 2 and then in game 3 they win 18 to 4. So things went off the rails a little bit there in that conference or in that championship series. But again, if you had just five runs, five runs, that's how many LSU needed to win the national title. And then you know in that last game they got 18. They got more than five runs. But it wasn't like LSU was this team, and I know people remember them for Dylan Cruz and all that. It wasn't like LSU was this team that raked their way through everything, and they were putting up nine, ten runs a game, no matter who was pitching to them. Uh, you saw Arkansas shut them down. You saw Florida and Wake Forest hold them down for long stretches. Even Tennessee, um, even the best offenses and the offenses that win national titles have weird moments where they face weird matchups and they they aren't able to get it going. Arkansas faced one of those this weekend. None of us expected that to be the case, so maybe that's what made it more jarring. But I do just want to clarify, like for everyone that's like, oh, this uh, this weekend showed that they're not going to be able to win a national title and all these things, it's not necessarily true. And when I say not necessarily true, I mean not true at all. Um, now, look, big picture, wrapping it all around, conclusion here. I'm not saying you should just accept the fact that Arkansas has been sucking on offense here, especially this past weekend. I'm not saying Arkansas doesn't have to hit a lot better down the stretch if they want to really be a team to, to be reckoned with. Uh, they have to hit much better than they hit this weekend. No doubt about that. But I do just like want to refresh your mind and re-put it into perspective of what the threshold is to win a national title. Most years, it's really not a ton. Uh, like, y'all remember, everyone talks about the drop fly ball. Do y'all remember what happened in that championship series before Arkansas dropped that fly ball? They won game two, like, five to three or something like that, which included a few unearned runs and some weird calls and stuff. Wasn't a super offensive game. And they were going to win that game, too, three to two, where they didn't hit a ton, and it was kind of some weird stuff going on. Wasn't a ton going on. The semifinal against Florida, Florida was, like, five to two. Uh, when you get to Omaha and you get on these high high-level – you know, matchups, it's very rarely a slugfest. It just very rarely is. It'll happen here and there, and obviously that's why you kind of want to have that elite offense in your back pocket in case you are at a slugfest. Uh, but these games, when the, when the stage gets big, it's really hard to string together a ton of offense. This Arkansas team is going to struggle to do it because they, you know, all the things that we've been talking about. But I do just want to point out that a lot of other teams are going to be struggling to string together offense when the moments get big and they're facing elite pitching, which Arkansas has. I hope I've done a good job. I've been bouncing all over the place here. I've been going for 35 minutes now and haven't taken a breath. I hope I've did it. I've done a good job of kind of, one, just rambling my own thoughts, but putting it all into perspective. And, you know, it kind of comes back to what I started the program with of the three things that I believe to be true. Arkansas sucked this weekend. It makes me a little concerned about Arkansas long-term and just kind of what they're going to look like in these big matchups with these elite teams. Arkansas is still a very prominent national title contender, arguably the favorite to win the whole damn thing. Um, so anyways, uh, I've rambled a lot here, so I'm going to have to cut this down a little bit. I did just want to touch on a few things that stuck out to me from game one. One, 
Hayden Smith had a no hitter going into the sixth inning, uh, which like I feel like was it's now just become like a footnote in this weekend. It was such a weird outing from Hagen Smith. He only gave up two hits, both of which came in that sixth inning. Did not give up a run. I believe he walked three. Only had six strikeouts. Bama was very aggressive against him, uh, which kind of helped him get through six innings. And, uh, you know, I thought it was like a a funny Hagen Smith outing. He threw six scoreless innings, and I think we were all kind of disappointed by it. Where we were like, oh, he just wasn't super sharp today. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't at his best. But I thought that really made you know made me laugh a good bit. Uh, Arkansas for those for those who don't remember, Arkansas jumped out to a five nothing lead on Ben Hess, who if you listen to last week's program, I was telling you has elite stuff and stuff that like really I was kind of concerned about going into that matchup with Arkansas. Of all the Bama pitchers that I thought they were going to struggle against, Ben Hess was kind of the one I had circled where I was like, I think he's due for a little bit more. Uh, I loved Arkansas's at-bats against Ben Hess. I really did. I thought they were working every count. I mean, through 101 pitches in five innings. It was kind of disappointing that they let him get through five. But they scored five runs on his ass. He did have eight strikeouts, but they, they worked three walks. They, they, they were kind of forcing him to work deep into accounts. He had a ton of innings where it was like 22, 23 pitches. They made him pay with a few long balls. Uh, I thought it was like a very productive Start to the game, they had some nice two-out hits there. Hudson White had a big two-out single. You had Ben McLaughlin and Jared Sprague out with the home runs. Diggs hustled home on a wild pitch. Like, early on, this was through three innings, by the way. I loved Arkansas's at-bats. I just love the way they were stringing things together. I was watching, I'm like, dude, Arkansas's about to smack these dudes. Because uh, obviously you get a 5-0 lead, you're like, you're, you know you're winning this game, uh, which they did by the skin of their teeth. They did. Um, but it just stopped there. They weren't able to build on that early momentum they had against Ben Hess. Like I said, ended up letting him go through five innings. But those first three innings, I thought were like peak, you know, what you want to see. Blue collar ABs, grinding them out, making them work. I thought those were really solid. Um, and then they didn't get a hit for the final five innings. I just, I don't know what to make of that. Normally, we see Arkansas kind of do a reverse formula where they start the game off really slow, struggle to get going, but then they kind of have a little spurt late. Arkansas had their spurt early in that in that game one. Um, rough weekend at the office for Will McIntyre, who came in and, and had a great inning to start his outing after Hagen left the game in the seventh inning, then ran into some trouble in the eighth inning. Uh, they bring in Stone Hewlett, who gets the one batter he faced out, as he tends to do. Um, but then, you know, Gabe Gackle, who continues to just be a freaking dude, comes in and closes out that game. I don't want y'all to leave this weekend overlooking what he did. I mean, he came in first and second, one out, I believe is what it was. Uh, and he just shut the door completely, strikes out the first guy he faces, gets fly out, uh, retires a side in order in the ninth. I believe he, yeah, he retired all five guys he faced. Gacko continues to just have a low heart rate in those moments. Wants the ball when the game's on the line. Uh, I, it's it's really hard not to be impressed with that dude. I can't wait to watch him pitch next year when he's a starting pitcher and he's going deep every week. Like I think we're gonna have to like he's. I, I've been saying Hagen Smith is appointment television. I think Gabe Gackle is gonna be appointment television next year, and I think he's got a lot of big innings to pitch for Arkansas this year, as you can clearly see. Um, but yeah, he, once Arkansas got through that game one, I had the feeling of like Arkansas didn't play super well. They still got a win they're about to hammer these dudes the next two days. Or they're at least, like, they're in good shape for the series. I, I definitely did not think that they were going to carry over that rough offensive performance. So just looking at the numbers, Arkansas finished with six hits in, in game two, which was in 10 innings, by the way. Uh, I believe all of their scoring was via the home run ball. I could be wrong on this. Yeah, I would, yeah. Peyton Stovall had a, had a home run rip to right field. Jared Spraglot tied the game of, uh, an inning later with a home run to left center. And then Peyton Holt hit the big two-out home run in the ninth inning to keep Arkansas alive. But Arkansas, in terms of just stringing together, having guys on base, none of that was there, man. They just were not working walks, uh, did not have hits in, in succession. It was just kind of like a good moment here, a good moment there, a nice swing there, followed by three bad ones. It just it, it you know there wasn't like a big picture takeaway. It was it, there wasn't any connective tissue between Arkansas's abs, which I think is the the th the thing that really stuck out to me and made me concerned for those last two games and really part of game one. 
Because it's not like Arkansas is like an inept, anemic offense that never gets anything going. You know, about once an inning, they'd have a good swing. And it would be like a base hit or a foul ball or like a ball squared up that gets caught or whatever. But there was just no momentum they were able to build. It's like if one guy had a good A-B, the next guy would follow with a rough one or there'd be a double play ball that'd kill it. Uh, It just never seemed like Arkansas was able to string together anything. Uh, But moving on to game two, though, I thought Mason Molina, if if we are talking about silver linings and things to build on, I thought that might have been overall the most encouraging Mason Molina outing. Uh, So he finished with, I guess, let's look at this here. Uh, He finished with seven strikeouts. No, six strikeouts and six innings of work. The first time Mason Molina has gone six innings this year, uh, I'd been kind of waiting on that. He had gone five and a third, and he had had outings where he was really good and struck out a lot of dudes, but it was really always a battle for him to work deep into games. He would always seem to have things that would derail him. So he gives up a home run in, let's see, the bottom of the second inning. Gives up a leadoff home run. Uh, Where was it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a leadoff home run. And then he then then they put first and third with zero outs like right off the bat. It was a uh, it was a rough one. Yeah, so you had the home run, then you had a double and then a bunt single, which was tough. So you have first and third, nobody out. He gets a big strikeout. He gets Matt Gassetti to pop out behind home plate, strikes out Eblen. Like I thought that was a huge moment in the game. Kept the score at 1-0. Uh Arkansas ends up uh, not doing anything in the third inning, of course. Then he comes up and gives up another home run to start the third inning. And this is kind of when you're like, all right, he might be in trouble here. He ends up hitting Will Hodo later in the inning, but he was able to, you know, just kind of flush it and move on. So Arkansas is down 2 0 going to, I guess, the third inning or the fourth inning here. And that's when Peyton Stovall finally, or I guess it was the top of the fifth when Peyton Stovall finally put a charge into one. And then Spraglot tied it there in the sixth inning. But Will, but Mason Molina gave Arkansas a chance to work back into the game. They refused to take them, take him up on that chance, but he did give Arkansas a chance to settle into the game. He kept he he limited the damage, stopped the bleeding, ends up battling through six innings, only gives up the two runs. That's what we call a call a quality start here around these parts. Uh, I thought it was a really encouraging outing. Because we knew Mason Molina was good. We knew he could have those big strikeout games. We knew he could hold guys down. And he's had experience as a starter. So we knew it was in there somewhere that he could give Arkansas some depth. Uh, And it was good to see him battle through it. Because it wasn't like a peak. Like if he had just had a game where he struck out 11, he was dotting everything, and he worked through seven innings, that would be awesome as well. But the fact that he was able to face some adversity, battle through it, and keep pushing, keep pushing, and get through six for Arkansas, I thought was a really encouraging sign. And since I'm talking about starting pitching, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I love Brady Tiger's outing on, on Sunday. Um, I thought it was gutsy. I thought that it, was, you know, it wasn't you know was peak Brady, Brady Tiger. He didn't have, like, elite command. I think he walked three guys, only struck out four and in five innings. Which, like, you know, with this Arkansas pitching staff, that's like bum behavior. Uh, a lot. He only had three strikeouts, had the two innings, gave up five hits, but a lot of them were singles. In fact, I think all of them were singles. In fact, yeah, they they definitely were all singles. Um, kind of felt like he always had traffic to deal with, whether it was his own or it was you know hitting guys, walking guys, giving up a little single here and there. Felt like he was always dealing with traffic. To work out of that with five innings and just the one run, uh, I thought was really encouraging. And from a stuff perspective, looking at his stuff, so the breaker is always like that's his go-to out pitch. It's always pretty good. Uh, his fastball was 90 to 92 with a couple 93s here and there. I thought it had a little bit more giddy-up on it, a little bit more movement than usual, and I thought he located a few of them really well. Uh, one that really – the one run he gave up was, I believe it was in the fourth inning – Let's see. Let me go back here and pull it up real quick. It was actually in the third inning. He faced Bryce Miller with runners on first and third and one out. And it was like a big moment. You're facing Bama's hitter who's hitting 400, who's been crushing in conference play. He'd been playing well against Arkansas through the weekend. And uh, he had a nice little battle with Tiger. And Tiger gets him swinging on a fastball that just went right over the heart of the plate, or right, right, started at the heart of the plate and then worked right in on his hands. 
really good stuff, really good execution, and he had been throwing him some breaking balls that he was fouling off and starting to get the hang of and starting to get the timing of, and he hit one really hard foul, and I was like, oh, man, he's he's on that breaker. Tiger busts him in with the fastball. I thought that was big-time stuff, man. I really – small thing, just like one at-bat there, but I thought it was, it was, it was nice to see Brady – be in the mix and fight. He ends up giving you five innings. I think it was like 80, 85 pitches or something like that. So he might be me. You know, if this were like an elimination game, probably could have given you one more. I was really encouraged by just what I saw from that guy. I, I, I think I think Arkansas starting pitching. I mean, if, if I'm not breaking any news to you, it's still really, really, really damn good. And I thought those three guys this weekend again wasn't like their best stuff. It wasn't like a firing on all cylinders type of weekend. But you see the stuff, you see the makeup, you see the mentality. It's hard not to feel confident with any of those dudes uh, there in the game. The guy that threw – now, this is the real – now, we're back to the bad stuff here. The kid who threw eight scoreless innings for Alabama, uh, Zane Adams, true freshman, talented kid, you know, you know, decent recruit. Like, he's going to have a nice career for Alabama, going to be a weekend starter and all that. Um, he had only thrown eight innings all year coming into this game and had not done super well against SEC competition. He'd been their midweek starter and been having some nice little moments, but really got roughed up last weekend against Kentucky. He was a, They didn't even announce him as the starter going into the weekend. It was still a TBA because they were going to see how things were going out. Um, to say that he that Arkansas, he held Arkansas down would be an understatement. He goes eight innings, gives up just the four hits, only walked one. Five strikeouts, too. So it wasn't even like he was just mowing them down. He was 88 to 90 with the fastball from the left side. Mixed speeds. Only threw 97 pitches in eight innings. That's a shameful performance from the Arkansas offense, man. And credit to, I'm not trying to take away from the kid. He pitched well. He's going to have a nice career at Bama. He's not a bad arm at all. Um, he's, he's, you know, he's fine. Arkansas's seen better. The fact that they uh, rolled over and let that boy pet their bellies is tough, man. That's a tough look. And uh, I don't know how you can try and justify it. I, I felt that was the most disapp- that's that's honestly now we're, we're we're finally getting around full circle. That's maybe the most disappointing part to me is that it wasn't like Arkansas had a ton of juice or a ton of energy or a ton of fight. It never felt like uh, Peyton Holt even hitting that game tying home run in the ninth inning. It just still never felt like Arkansas was was wanted it as bad as Alabama. It felt like Arkansas got out competed a little bit, got out toughed a little bit. Uh, and look, Alabama should have entered this weekend in desperation mode after a rough weekend against Kentucky. So it's not stunning to me that they wanted that series a little bit more than Arkansas and being at home, that they were able to make it happen, like credit to them. But you just don't see Arkansas you know, face teams where it's clear the other team wants it more. It's, you don't see that too often. Uh, and so seeing it this weekend was a little, little concerning. Um, so we wrapped it all up big picture. Like, again... Guys, I'm not like panicking. I'm not wavering on whether or not this team is awesome and whether or not this team can win a national title. They're still my pick to do it. Like still after everything I've said, they're still my pick to do it. I just want to see a little bit of that dog come out. That's why we got it on the missing persons poster here. I just want to see a little bit of that dog come out. I want to see this team fight. I want to see this team respond to adversity. They were met with a very good chance to respond to adversity Sunday, and they just didn't show up at all other than Brady Tigert. Um, it's a rough showing, man. It was rough, and uh, there ain't no two ways around it. Let's move on a little bit, and let's talk about the SEC and kind of just what went on before we get out of here. Um, so let's see. I'm on the SEC Sports website, which likes to be wrong every now and then, but it's all good. Let's see. Do-do-do-do. What's today's date? Today's the 15th. Okay. Going back to Thursday night, Georgia and Missouri had a th- had a Thursday through Saturday series, which shouldn't be on you guys' radar too much because Arkansas already played Missouri and they don't play Georgia, although Wes Johnson is there. Uh, started off the series 15-10. to 10. Georgia takes the win there in Athens. Back and forth, pretty wild considering Missouri only scored one run against Arkansas. Not a super offensive team. And uh, didn't have the it didn't have what it took to win a slugfest against Georgia, who can really freaking swing it. Uh, I mean, Charlie Condone, you guys know about him. They've got a ton of older pieces in that lineup. They've been they've been as good as any offense in SEC play. Uh, Auburn, Kentucky was the other Thursday through Saturday series. Game one was really tough. Uh, Kentucky takes that one six to five. You kind of think, oh man, it's gonna be a nice little series there in Auburn. 
Kentucky ends up sweeping those boys. And I should mention that Georgia went on to win that series against Missouri two out of three. Another nice little series win for the dogs. Missouri's not bad, though, man. They're really not. They're now, I guess, let's see, five and ten in SEC play. They're not a bad group, but they're, I think they're – I mean, shit. They're gonna end up. They're gonna end up going to Hoover if LSU and Auburn don't pick it up. We'll see how it plays out. But Missouri's gotten a little bit better here in these last few weeks. Uh, that'll help Arkansas's RPI and all that stuff. Uh, Georgia looks like they're gonna make the tournament. Wes Johnson's done a really nice job with that group through through. Uh, I guess nine weeks now. Pitching, they're still not pitching lights out, which is interesting because it's a Wes Johnson team. Uh, that's gonna be a team nobody really wants to face down the stretch. I'll just tell you. Um, but moving on a little bit. South Carolina whipped up on Florida a little bit. Um, while I'm talking about this, I want to scroll down just to fact check myself and make sense, make sure I'm accurate here. Yes, Florida staved off elimination or staved off a sweep by taking game three, 11 to nine. But South Carolina beat them 10 to three in game one, and they beat them nine to eight in game two, which looks like it was a close game. But uh, Florida had to score five runs there at the end just to make it close. It looked like South Carolina was about to run rule those boys in game two. It, you know, the Gamecocks, that's not going to be an easy series for Arkansas, who, you know, they travel to Columbia this weekend. We'll see how it goes. But, uh, yeah, it, it it was Florida. Florida's struggling a little bit. They're now 7-8 and eight in conference play, under 500. I believe their record for the year is 18-17, and 17, which is freaking crazy. Um, now, they're probably not going to end up on the bubble just because their metrics are good because they have all these quality wins and stuff like that. I haven't looked at where their RPI is at. And I'd imagine they'll win a lot of games down the stretch. But when Florida comes to Arkansas next weekend, not this upcoming one, next weekend, there's going to be a lot of stakes in that series, man, especially if Arkansas is not able to recruit, regroup a little bit and get a series win here against South Carolina. That series against Florida – it's going to be tense, man. It's going to be really tense for both programs there. Because uh, if Arkansas goes out there and sweeps Florida, you know, you do the math. I don't even know who Florida plays this weekend, 7-11. and 11. So say they win their series this weekend and they're 9-9 nine and nine in SEC play. You get swept by Arkansas and you're 9-12, and 12, those last few series are going to get real hairy because, uh, like we talked about, like 500 is kind of the magic number. Once you get to 500 in SEC play, you're usually safe. And anything above that, you're definitely safe. Right at 500 or right below, that's the that's the weird gray area there. Uh, Florida, it would be in their best interest to avoid that. We'll see if they can do it. Uh, the Egg Bowl took place this weekend. The Egg Bowl and baseball took place. So look, let's look here. Friday night, uh, Mississippi State beat those dudes. I don't remember what the score was. I don't know why they don't have it here on SEC Sports, but Mississippi State won on Friday night. Ole Miss wins on Saturday night. They come back for a rubber match, and all these games were pretty close. And they come back for a rubber match on Sunday, and then Ole Miss just kills them, 14-2. to two. Uh, Mississippi State's a team that I like a lot, and I feel like they're you know, going to give Arkansas a tough series you know, in Fayetteville, I'd imagine, down the stretch because they might be fighting for their tournament lives. That's a tough series loss, man, losing to your rival. That's a team that you probably need to get the job done against. They're five and ten in SEC play. When you're on that bubble and you're trying to secure your spot in the NCAA tournament, you probably got to win that series against Ole Miss, who's not a really good baseball team. Because Mississippi State's got some tough tests down the stretch, as does as does pretty much everybody here. Um, you know, we'll see how it works out for the Bulldogs. But I thought that was a very interesting little little uh, series result there. It doesn't have a ton of implications in regards to Arkansas, but I think it really just speaks to how close and how competitive everything really is in this conference and how much I mean you're seeing all these different direct you know records that vary from 14-1 to 2-13 and but uh you guys saw Arkansas play against Auburn you would agree there's not that much separation between those two teams and I feel like it's kind of that way all around and so it's just like there's so much stake in all these matchups uh, it's always fascinating to see play out um I could be wrong Let's see, a and did a and sweep Vandy? I think they may have swept Vandy. Let me fact check this just to make sure. I'm pre- yeah, A&M swept Vandy this weekend, which is quite the loud performance, especially because some of those games weren't close. I mean, they won 15 nothing in game one, uh, and they won game three, nine to nothing. Oh, I'm sorry, no, 12-6 game three, game two was nine to nothing. So really none of those games 
were super tightly contested. Vanderbilt now falls to eight and seven in SEC play. I think they got exposed as a fake contender uh, this weekend, at least because it's like you know if you if you had lost a series and maybe it was back and forth here, you know you're at College Station. There's no shame in losing that series, but getting swept and not having any of the games be competitive is a little bit of a fraud check. And A uh, and M is now the number one team in the country after that weekend. By the way, I guess I should mention that I'll probably make the title of this something about Arkansas now no longer being number one. But, uh, yeah, a and man, that's the team to watch in this league, man. I've been saying that all year. Anyone who's been watching this program can fact check me. I've been saying all year a and is the team not named Arkansas that, like, really strikes fear into me uh, as an SEC opponent and a national title contender. Uh, Florida's got a ton of talent. LSU might not make the damn tournament. We'll get to them in a second. Tennessee's really good. They swept LSU. I still think a and is the number one, you know, challenge to Arkansas's throne um I guess I say throne they're not they're not on a throne they haven't won anything yet uh, if Arkansas wants to repeat as SEC champions because they did win the SEC last year they're gonna have to beat A&M in College Station that's gonna be a tough one uh I mentioned LSU just an anemic offense man they just don't have the bats one through nine and their pitching is not good enough to carry their bats so it's like LSU's really just struggling here they're now 3-12 and 12 in SEC play. Everyone called me a madman on Twitter whenever I said LSU might miss the tournament. I, I would I don't know what the odds or the, the statistics are on this, but I would have to imagine they face a very much an uphill battle in terms of making the tournament. I, I mean, they would have to really play well down the stretch and win a ton of games. I mean, 3-12, and 12, they're three games away to where they'd have to win out just to go 5-15 and 15, or 15 and 15. And even then, it's not guaranteed that you make the tournament. Good luck. Good luck, Tigers. Couldn't happen to a worse group of people. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one, man. Uh, but Tennessee looks to be pretty well-rounded. Tennessee's lineup is not, like, raking per se. Like, this isn't this isn't necessarily as good of a Tennessee offensive as they've had in previous years, most notably 2022. And uh, pitching staff-wise might not be as dominant as that same 2022 one and some of the best pitching staff they've had. But Tennessee's really well-rounded. Uh, they're just a tough out every weekend because they have guys who have a ton of power. Their lineup has a ton of punch in the middle. Their front line arms are really good, too. They just have a nice little mix of skill sets. Uh, I don't know if they're necessarily quite on the level of Arkansas and Texas A&M, but we'll see. There's plenty of time for them to prove it. I guess they're number three in the rankings. I haven't looked at it fully. Um, but, man, a lot of good ball being played all around the SEC a lot of interesting series results here. I hope I didn't miss any. I don't think I did. You know, I just touched on Tennessee LSU, who Tennessee did sweep them, in case you didn't hear that. Um, but, yeah, here's where we stand now. You see the records. You see all that. I'm, I'm blocking out Missouri a little bit, but that's where things stand. Arkansas has got a massive series against South Carolina upcoming. They've also got a very fun two-game midweek series against Texas Tech, which doesn't mean a ton. Like, if Arkansas loses both those games, it's not going to be a big deal. People will freak out. It really doesn't mean anything in the long run. But given how this weekend played out, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Arkansas responds, especially because you're back at home for a little bit before you go out on the road again. You really want to get that positive vibe and positive energy back. Uh, it would be in Arkansas's best interest to go ahead and win these two games. Ben Bybee, by the way, if you're looking for something to watch, we'll see what the lineups look like. Obviously, Arkansas just needs to hit. That's what you need to be looking for. But also, Ben Bybee is a dude who has been pitching really well on the weekends, uh, sorry, on in midweek games, uh, I believe he's now up to – let me see if I can go back to this. So Ben Bybee has now thrown nine innings and given up one earned run in midweek games. So if he throws together another really good midweek start against a, a power team, that would be a, quite the statement for him to show, hey, I'm ready to contribute on these weekends. So we'll see if he's able to do something. Colin Fisher, I would assume, would get the other Wednesday start there. Uh, looking forward to seeing what Arkansas can do in – not going to put too much stake into two midweek games just because that's not what we do around here. But we will be back later this week. I'm not sure what the schedule will look like. Still waiting on a couple guests that may or may not come on the program. If I can get those guys booked, then we might have another one of those episodes. But I think ultimately what I'm planning on doing is doing a Thursday pod. And then I think we're going to do the same Q&A type of thing Friday before the series happens. I uh, would love to do that. Uh, well, hopefully we can make it work. 
but uh, I'll I'll keep you guys updated completely on the schedule. We'll either be back Wednesday, tomorrow with players, who knows, or Thursday to preview the series. But I believe we're going to try to do three pods this week, one of which being a live pod. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, if I did not cover everything that is on your mind, be sure to always let me know in the comments. I love reading you guys' comments and interacting and all that. Um, you know, like, subscribe, do all the stuff. You know the drill. It's been another fun edition of the Bombastic Podcast. I appreciate you guys for joining me. I will see you soon.